Hello there. I'm guessing if you found this video, then you are probably where I was a couple of weeks ago when I was researching the heck out of how to find and set up some kind of high performance network attached storage or NAS device that you can use in your home or office to safely store and work with very large amounts of data. Uh, I needed a solution and pretty quickly because I'm just running out of space on my local hard drive on my iMac Pro that I have in front of me here. Especially since I've started up a brand new YouTube channel and I'm also starting up a new business along with doing videography and aerial cinematography. And a lot of this work is being done in 4K which can just gobble up your entire hard drive space in the blink of an eye. Especially if you happen to be working on multiple versions of your projects at the same time. So today we're going to take a look at how to set up a new Synology NAS device, specifically their 8-bay uh, DS1819 Plus disk station. Uh, I've never set up something like this before, so we're gonna figure this out together. Now, I heard that it's feasible to edit video directly on a NAS device over a 10 gig network connection, but I don't know if it's gonna be possible to do this at 4K. So that's something that we're gonna have to take a look at here. Uh, I did try to plan and prepare for eventually working with a more substantial remote network attached storage device when we renovated the lower level of our house here. And I ran by myself about a mile of Cat 6A cable all throughout the downstairs space and upstairs through the attic where I dropped cables down into pretty much all the upstairs rooms, effectively retrofitting my entire house with Cat 6 network cable. Uh, as a quick side note, in my previous homes, and including this one, I've had the opportunity to be involved with new construction. And one of the most important pieces of advice I can offer you if you happen to be building or working with new construction is to make sure that you run a three inch PVC pipe that goes from the attic all the way through to the basement through a wall or a closet uh, to just cover all of the floors in the home. Because if you do this, you're gonna be future-proofed for any cabling needs that you may have down the road. I didn't want to waste anyone's time with an unboxing. I already took all the equipment out of the box, as you can see here. Uh, and I really just want to get the most uh, important bits and jump right into the installation. But before we do, uh, let's go over one of the goals of this video that I really want to figure out. And that is, I do want to see, is it possible to edit 4K video directly on the NAS? And also, uh, to what degree do we see any kind of limitations or performance degradation when editing and working with a 4K project directly on the NAS. Now the answer to this is kind of critical because it will basically define what kind of workflow is necessary in terms of file management to get the required performance. In other words, if the editing performance isn't adequate, I'm gonna have to figure out a way to work locally and then save and store the finished files and assets separately, which of course we know is possible, but ideally I wanna be able to work straight off the NAS if I can. So what do you need to have to run a 10 gig network? So if you're running from your computer to your NAS, the simplest setup is basically gonna be a direct connection from your computer to the NAS drive. And in that case, you need an interface on your computer or your laptop uh, that supports a 10 gig E speed via a network card or some kind of an adapter and run the cable directly from the computer straight into the NAS. Now, while this setup is rather simple, it does have some drawbacks. It will not allow anyone else on the network to use the NAS and also it requires the NAS to basically be sitting on your desk or in the same room, which is not always ideal. A more advanced setup is going to be to try to run connections to the NAS through a switch that's capable of switching packets at 10 gig E speeds. Now this is gonna allow you to do more complex things with a switch, like have multiple people access the NAS via the switch so you can have all the computers in your home uh, or office network uh, to be able to back up their files there, for example. Now, not all the computers need to support 10 gig E speed uh, to access the switch, only the computers that will require it. But for those devices that do need 10 gig speed, they each need to have some kind of 10 gig uh, card and capability. And your switch needs to have enough 10 gig E ports and connections to support all the computers and devices that you want to run 10 gig to. So in my case, my iMac Pro here is the only device in our home that needs that capability at this time. Also, my switch has only two 10 gig E ports, one going in and one going out, and that's fine. Nobody else needs that performance right now. And I can always upgrade the switch later if I need to, but I can back up all the other computers in the house to the NAS at one gig speed, which is plenty fast for that task. For the more advanced setup with a switch, 
um, and not just a direct connection. Your computer needs to support Tengigi internally, as I described, with a card or an adapter. And as a side note, if you're a Mac user like I am, only the Mac Pro, iMac Pro and the almighty Mac Pro supports neg native 10 gig uh, capability via an RJ45 port in the back. The regular iMac and MacBook Pros do not, but I'm pretty sure that with an adapter, you can achieve 10 gig speeds or greater through their Thunderbolt 3 connections. Now, it's vital that all, and I mean all your network cabling between your computer and your NAS are of the highest quality possible. That's going from the wall outlet, the cables you know that go inside the wall, even the patch cables that you may have that are going from a patch panel to your switch and out to your NAS. They all need to connect through the highest quality cables that are rated for 10 gig speeds over the distances that you have to cover. If any one cable is subpar and or not rated or properly shielded, you're not gonna get the desired performance. I've read a number of reviews on Amazon regarding cables that are rated for 10 gig speeds that failed to deliver and ultimately resulted in a lot of unhappy customers. In my case, the distance between this computer here and the NAS in the AV closet in the other room is probably about 50 linear feet. So it's a relatively short distance and I run very thick CAT6A cabling, which has quite a bit of a thicker shielding and it's really quite stiff to work with. So I kind of overbuilt the network here on my part, but I just want to make sure I point out to purchase the highest quality cables possible. So if you're not connecting your computer directly to the NAS, you will need a switch that's capable of switching packets at 10 gig speeds. This will be noted as having one or more SFP plus ports, which are guaranteed to switch at 10 gig speeds, not just SFP ports. Those are only guaranteed to switch at one gig. You need SFP plus ports. So look for that on your switch. The switch that I recently installed is from Ubiquity. It's their 48 port switch. And this has um, two of the available ports uh, that are SFP plus ports. And it also has two SFP ports. And it also is a managed switch. And a managed switch, if you don't know, basically means it has the ability to support separate subnetworks, commonly referred to as VLANs or virtual LANs, that let you isolate traffic from each other. And this is useful if uh, you want to cordon off traffic seen by your smart devices in the home from, say, your work and office computers and files there, as well as set up a guest network and maybe a separate network for your cameras and even a kid's network if you want to isolate their traffic from the rest of the um, traffic on your network for any reason. So the last device in the chain that you're going to need, of course, is a network attached storage drive that is specifically capable of handling 10 gig traffic to and from the device. So again, the device I'm gonna install here is the Synology DS1819 Plus disk station. It holds eight drives. Um, and after doing tons of research, I decided to go with Synology because of the very positive reviews that I read on their support, reliability, and especially the software management system, which I haven't actually tried yet, but from what I've read uh, from many people that are a lot smarter than myself, it seems to be really easy to use uh, interface-wise, and they have a very straightforward proprietary RAID scheme that makes it easy to swap out drives if one or more fail while maintaining solid performance. So one more thing that you may or may not already know is that you do not need your router in your network to support 10 gig speeds to achieve 10 gig performance between two or more devices in the network, so long as those devices are in the same subnetwork or the same VLAN. Uh, VLANs and networking may be a little new to you. They are certainly new to me as of just a couple of months ago, but it's okay if it's a new concept. There's a ton of great resources out there on YouTube that can explain what these are in great detail. And eventually I'm gonna make a video of my own network setup here where I figured all this stuff out and I'll take you through how I set all this stuff up. Anyway, let's take a look at the goodies that we need to install and the tasks that we need to perform to get all this stuff rolling. So this is the Synology disk station. Hmm. Right now it is empty. And it's pretty heavy. Well, that's good. I spent a lot of money on it. it. Should feel heavy. I'm going to be putting in five Seagate six terabyte Iron Wolf high speed 7200 RPM drives to get it started. Now, Synology has a really cool RAID calculator on their website that shows you the amount of space that you'll have available for use depending on what size and how many drives you intend to use. The RAID calculator is very cool and you can see how you can swap out bigger drives later on. Uh, in real time, just hot swap them out for drives of a larger size and see how that affects 
your storage configuration. So going over all of the different RAID configurations and how they work is beyond the scope of this video. There are a ton of videos that explain what each RAID level achieves, um, but one of the things I really liked about Synology is they have a proprietary RAID configuration called SHR, which stands for Synology Hybrid RAID that makes it easier to manage and handle RAID expansion even with a newbie like me and achieve a similar or better level of performance from what I can tell. But for now, I'm choosing to go with the SHR2 configuration, which will allow me to fail up to two drives and still keep all the data intact while the drives are being hot swapped out and replaced. Now, the main reason I'm going with SHR2 versus SHR1 is that basically if you have a failed drive with SHR1, while you're in the middle of swapping it out, if you happen to have a, a, an additional failure, then you can lose the whole array. With SHR2, it affords just another level of protection in the event of a failed drive when you're replacing and rebuilding a failed drive. Now you pay for the extra security because you don't get to use as much of the total available drive space that you would with SHR1. But for me, it just makes a little bit more sense to make that trade-off for the extra data security and peace of mind. Now, there are a few other tasks that we have to perform in order to get this thing working. This particular Synology model is what they call 10 gig E ready, meaning I can't just plug it into one of these ports on the back here and expect to get 10 gig working right off the bat. This unit has an internal expansion slot. I think it's over here that lets you plug in a card to raise the efficiency of the device. I'm gonna put this over here. You can either put in one of two things. You can either put in one SSD card that basically contains a small little SSD drive right on the card. And this allows the unit to work much faster by caching a bunch of its calculations locally, thereby increasing the unit's internal speed. Or you can instead install what we're gonna install here today, which is a 10 gig network interface card or NIC for short. Now, what if we could have both the SSD drive and 10 gig uh, network capability? Well, in the making of this video, I literally just happened to be searching and I discovered that a product is being made right now for Synology. It's a new card that contains both in one card. It's a brand new product and it won't be available till close to the end of the year, but I will definitely be watching to see what the reviews are like on this when it eventually comes out. We just don't know yet how the performance is going to work with 10 gig. So we're gonna do some tests here, but if there is room to improve, then this card may be something that I'll look into down the road. So back to the tasks that we have to perform to get this going. Um, as I said, we got to put in five, six terabyte hard drives. I have five of these. This is what one of them looks like in a box. We have to put in the 10 gig uh, network interface card to get the 10 gig speed. And I have to install two of these in the switch. What these are, are transceiver modules. And they basically are gonna allow me to connect an RJ45, you know, a standard Cat6 cable into the switch, which would in its SFP plus port, which is designed to work with either copper connection through one of these or a fiber optic connection, which is not what I have uh, installed in my house. So I'm hoping that these just slip right into the open ports. I'm pretty sure that's, that's all that happens. They just click into place. I don't think there's any configuration that's required, although I'll need to check that. And then my cable will just, you know, click right into here on the inside, the, uh, the input port, and then another one for the output port that goes into the NAS. So the last thing that we'll have to do after we hook up all the hardware is we need to configure the software side of the Synology and set up its RAID configuration with SHR2. So let's take a quick peek in the location where all this equipment is going to be installed before we get started. And the back of the rack looks like this. Um, believe it or not, just a couple of months ago, this was nothing more than that. You can see it down there that Airport Extreme router. Um, so <laughs> I've done a lot in here uh, and I plan to do a whole video on kind of this network setup, this big network upgrade that I did, um, but that's for another video. Um, so I just want to do like a real brief overview of kind of like what's in the rack at this point. So I guess just, you know, coming out of the wall, um, you can see I have my uh, cable modem comes out here the, for the cable for the house. Um, the blue wires are all Cat6 networking that are a whole bunch of drops that go all over the house. Um, the white wires are for future um, speakers 
that are going to be going to the home theater room, which I wired for Dolby Atmos and Oro 3D, the two immersive audio 3D formats. And um, there's a bunch of just empty spaces on the rack here. It's really not very set up. It's just kind of at the beginning stages of getting um, kind of getting set up. Um, at the top uh, left up here, I've got a cable modem and NG4 uh, firewall slash router. Um, and this is the disk station. So this is just, I just placed it here. I just wanted to make sure that it was basically going to fit uh, in here, which it does nicely. So that's where it's going to ultimately live. And um, below that is the, um, is the switch. Um, so this is the, the Unify Network 48 port switch. Um, below that, you can see here, we've got um, a patch panel. So all of the, 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 well, the networking drops, the blue cables, all the Cat6 over here, all that comes in and it feeds into the bottom of the patch panel. And out of that, we have the little shorties that go into the switch ports. Now, over on the right here, this is where we have the SFP Plus. There's two ports, one, two and the SFP ports, one, two. So these two are, are only guaranteed to produce one gig speed. These two are guaranteed to produce 10 gig speeds. So um, I'm gonna have to take out these little, um, there's like these little rubber plugs and the little um, 10 gig RJ45 transceivers are gonna go, they should just plug right into there. I've never done it before, but we're gonna find out. I think they just plug right into these little, these little holes. And then basically out of the patch where whichever one I have for the, the iMac Pro is gonna come out of there and it's gonna go into uh, the bottom one, I believe. And then out of the top one, it's gonna go into um, one of the ports on the NAS. There's four, there's four ports here. Um, they're all, I think, defaulted to one gig. So I'm gonna have to um, figure out and probably watch someone else's YouTube video on how to take it apart and install the 10 gig PCIe card. Um, but um, those are, uh, the connections that are going to have to be made to kind of put this together. And um, just to reiterate, it is super important that all of the network connections are guaranteed to run at 10 gig speed. I've read a number of cases where, you know, wires like this, people were disappointed, unfortunately, to find out that they couldn't support 10 gig speeds. Um, the reviews I read, read on these particular ones are pretty good, so I'm going to try them. But if I don't get the kind of performance that I'm looking for, I will probably build my own cables out of this blue cat 6a material because i have a bunch of it left over and i know that that's heavily shielded it's absolutely rated to support speeds higher than that um, so if i have to i'll make my own connection that is currently what i did um, from the back of the imac pro going into the wall port um, i've just made my own connection there and i made all and i did all the wiring myself so i know that that's all going to be solid coming up into here this is probably the only um Weak, weak point that could be an issue in delivering the 10 gig speed. All right, so before we get going with the install of the hardware and the software configuration of the Synology, we have to run a couple of tests first because we need to establish some kind of working baseline as to what things feel like working locally here on the iMac Pro's local SSD drive so we have something to compare to when working remotely across the network. So I prepared a couple of tests that we're gonna run now. Then once everything's set up, we're gonna move all the data over and we're gonna run the tests over there. So let's get testing. So here we are in DaVinci Resolve Studio 16. This is the paid version of the software. I have made sure that the CPU is completely idle. There's really nothing going on with the CPU. You can see here that it's idle 97.94%. We're gonna work on a couple of tests here uh, locally to the local SSD drive. So here in DaVinci Resolve, I have a recent project that I just completed for a client. The clips are 4K, so it has a fairly high bitrate requirement to import these clips and work with the, the disk cache. And uh, I figured we can probably establish some kind of reasonable baseline by testing five specific things, both locally and then doing these same tests remotely over the 10 gig connection uh, once we you know, move the database and migrate everything over to the NAS. So the five tests that I want to perform are going to be a baseline test of the read and write uh, speed to disk, which um, we'll use a tool by Asia Video Systems. Um, the time it takes to load the software, DaVinci Resolve, and this project to a state of readiness to work, because that presumably will read quite a bit of the cache uh, files off of the, the disk to kind of get everything up and ready in, in memory. Um, then we're gonna establish if the project 
plays back effectively in real time. And we're going to compute the time of an ex fairly expensive recaching of a couple of clips to disk. We'll delete the caches and we'll recache something expensive. Uh, and then finally, we'll take the time that it takes to write out the whole project to disk in 4K, like the final delivery spec that I had delivered it at using the same settings that I, I had used before. Let's first run a baseline test. So we're gonna load this cool little disk utility here uh, by Asia Video Systems. And uh, I've already selected you know, my local target disk, which is just my user's drive on this system. And if I hit start, um, you can see that it is recording um, pretty darn fast read and write speeds. Now, we need to convert these read and write figures to gigabits per second. To do that, we have to divide these numbers in megabits per second by 125. So if you look at the figures, they kind of start low, and then as the packets are being fed, um, they kind of get higher as things get a little bit more efficient. So at the low end, we're seeing figures around 16 gigabytes per set or gigabits per second for the write speed and eight gigabits per second for the read. And at the high end, we're seeing around 23.2 gigabits per second for write and 19.2 gigabits per second for the read. So this is going to be interesting um, because on the high end, these figures are way faster than any 10 gig connection. Uh, in terms of actual or expected throughput, I'm not really sure what's reasonable. You know, video editing is going to use much larger packets of data than, say, file transfers or backups that might use much smaller bits of data. So I'm not really sure if you know, the video editing speeds to the local drive would be more representative of these higher figures or the lower figures. Now, the Synology um, device, uh, let me actually pull that up really quick here, is rated, uh, you can see here, for um, 2,045 megabits per second um, and 600, only 650 megabits per second for the writing. Um, so that's basically 16.36 gigabits, gigabits per second for the reads and uh, only 5.25 gigabits per second for the writes. So um, yeah, so that's gonna be kind of interesting. Uh, ultimately, I do think the proof in the pudding is going to be um, you know, what happens with the actual footage testing. Okay, so for this second test, we're gonna run something that is probably a little unscientific here. I'm really curious to see how long does it take to load DaVinci Resolve locally and load the project locally into memory and get it working from the disk cache um, versus when we introduce the variable of running it across the network. Uh, I've worked with some really heavy software in the past in my years in animation, and it can take you know many minutes sometimes to load a program across a network that's very heavy with a lot of data attached to it. So I'm just curious to see here with the changes that we're making to our network configuration to see how much longer, if any, does it take to just load what I would consider a typical working um, project file in DaVinci Resolve to a state of readiness in memory while pulling it across the network. So the first test we have to run is to run it locally. I'm going to do that with a stopwatch, just my iPhone here. I'm going to click start as soon as I double click the icon, and then I will click the project that we need to get uh, that we're going to be testing uh, and just see how long does it roughly take to get that going. And uh, well, here we go with that. Let's uh, hit start. There we go. We are off to the races. And there we are. Okay, so boom, I hit stop. So that took 31 seconds. Uh, I'm going to run it one more time again, just to see how much variable there was in this unscientific test here. Here we go, loading. Boom, okay, 28 seconds. So the first time we ran it, this took 31 seconds. Running it a second time took 28 seconds. I guess if we average those out, it's gonna be roughly approximately 30 seconds to load. So let's just remember approximately 30 seconds to load the program from scratch uh, off the, the local disk. And we'll just have this in at one, as one of our many tests that we're gonna run when we have everything set up and the data is um, locally on the, the, uh, the network attached storage device. So that's it for this test. Let's go on to the next one. Let's get back to DaVinci Resolve. And here, I haven't set anything like proxies, so the playback of the clips will be at uh, full 4K. So let's just, I don't know, let's just grab a, a section in the middle of it here and see, let me just dim the kind of the volume. And, um, you know, we can see that this is playing back nice and smooth. There's no hitches or anything like that. This is 
you know, spoiler alert, it's playing back at, as expected, which it darn well should at <laughs> uh, on the local disc at, at in real time. Nice smooth scrubbing of the playhead just as I kind of move along here. I mean, I'm really scrubbing very quickly, but that's uh, that's fine. For the next test, I want to basically recompute a couple of, um, of clips that are very, very heavy. So let me just kind of zoom in here. I've kind of selected these two clips. This has a fairly expensive um, transition and there's a lot of noise reduction on these clips because it was a little bit of a dark clip that I had to lift and it uh, kind of exposed a bit of noise here. So let me take these two clips. I'm gonna go into the playback and I'm gonna tell DaVinci Resolve to delete um, the cache for these selected clips. Now, what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna go into my iPhone and I'm gonna go into my stopwatch and I'm gonna reset it to zero. And as soon as I click yes, I'm going to hit the start button to see just how long this takes. So here we go, simultaneous start and yes. And there we go, stop. This took just a hair over 56 seconds. I did this test separately a couple of times. The good thing is, is that every time I did it, it came within less than one second of the same time. And of course, we're gonna do all these tests again on the, uh, on the NAS once we move the entire project over. So the last test that we wanna do is we want to render out this entire clip and see how long it takes. So I'm going to um, just call this speed test. And I'm gonna add this to the render queue, which is gonna render out the entire job. And again, I'm gonna go into my stopwatch and I'm gonna hit start at the same time I hit start render. And there we go. We're gonna start rendering this whole thing out and see how long it takes. Now, I will probably speed this up so that we don't spend you know many minutes here on the video to get the result. So stand by while we speed this up. And okay, so we got to the end and it took 12, 1, 12 minutes and 16 seconds according to the completed um, result of this render node. And uh, I came up with 12.23 seconds on my stopwatch, so probably just a little bit off there, but basically about the same, um, about 12 and uh, a quarter or so minutes to complete the project. So that's great. So with these tests out of the way, um, we're now gonna go ahead and build up this raid and get everything going. And um, we'll see you on the other side of that to then uh, run these tests all over again with everything moved over to the NAS. So stay tuned for that. So here we go, we're trying to take apart our Synology. Um, so far, I just took the, uh, the Synology uh, EG10 G18-T1 out of the box. Uh, basically, we have the little card right here. It has a little long uh, adapter bracket. Not sure yet if I have to use that, but this is the card. It has a pretty darn big heat sink on it, um, and you can see the one network connection. They do make this card with two um, network connections if you need that to have more than one computer accessing it at 10 gig at the same time, uh, but I'm not going to need that. Um, and so just to get started here, I just used this little jeweler screwdriver and just took out the, the six screws here. And we're about to pop the case off and let's uh, see what's inside. Okay, so far a piece of cake. Um, cake cover came off and you can see here is the PCIe slot where our new card is gonna go. Um, there's a little tiny, um, I don't know, just like I guess a little protective bracket here. I see a screw on the top there. And I don't know if I have to remove it there or if I have to remove it in the back here. But anyway, we gotta take that, that little guy off before we put the card in. So I just wanted to show this to you and uh, this is what we're gonna do right now. Hold on one sec. And okay, two seconds later, <laughs> I popped the card in. That went in just with a little tiny snap. Uh, I did have to remove um, both uh, little screws of this guy here. There was the, the top one on the top of that and then this was the one that was in the back. And uh, I'm going to have to put, I believe, this little guy back because there is a little bit of this exposed um, part here just because the, the card, this little daughter card is kind of small. So I think that that will close up that little gap there. I could probably install this longer um, plate if I wanted to, but you know what? I'm gonna just put this little guy back on. It's gonna be just fine enough to, to do that. 
but the card is in. That took up all of about three seconds to pop that baby in. So, so far this job is really super simple. Like anybody can do this. All right, let's put the cover back on. Okay, so the next step here, now that we've got the card installed, um, is we're gonna put in the actual drives. So Synology comes with this nice little quick start manual that um, basically just tells you how to put the drives in and it doesn't look too hard. Um, so I have five of these uh, Seagate Ironwolf uh, six terabyte drives to get things started here. And um, this is what one, one of them looks like as I t you take it out of the package. It just has some nice protection on it. So I'm gonna go ahead and get these installed and uh, each to the first five um, bays here of this uh, chassis. So let's get that going. So I got one of them in, that wasn't too hard. Um, basically they come out of the chassis, you just basically press this, which just releases that. This chassis thing slides out here and there's two um, little plastic things on each side that just pop out. And if you're putting in uh, SATA drives like these, um, there's basically no tools involved. Um, the plastic things just snap back in holding and securing the drive in place. If you're gonna be putting in um, SSD drives, then you use these little screws here. And unfortunately I opened up the bag already and now I have to find a container to put them back in, but it doesn't look like we need any kind of screws or tools when dealing with um, SATA drives. So anyway, this is one of five and we're gonna put the rest in. All right, so here we go. The RAID is now populated with an array of five drives and it's ready to go in the rack and we're ready to fire this thing up. But before we do that, I'm gonna take us over to the Synology website real quick. I wanna show you guys the RAID calculation tool. Uh, it's a really useful tool and it'll demonstrate what this particular setup is gonna look like with the, SH, the SHR2 RAID configuration, uh, as well as what uh, it would like if I were to later try to expand the storage. So let's take a look at that real quick before we fire this thing up. Okay, so here we are on the Synology website and uh, this is the model here that we're working with today. But if you go down to the bottom, um, over here you have this RAID calculator. And this is a really useful tool. Um, basically what you do is you select which kind of drives you intend to start populating your array with. So here we're gonna use the six terabyte option. So if I click it once, it shows one drive in the first bay. If I click it again, it shows you two. And it kind of shows you now with the different RAID, to, you know, you can compare two different RAID options. So you can compare SHR, SHR2, RAID 0 through 10, and something called RAID F1. I don't know what RAID F1 is. Anyway, I'm going to put um, SHR and SHR2 because I've already done some of the looking, the research in this, and I decided I'm pretty much going to go with this as the SHR2. So with just two drives, SHR2 says insufficient hard drive space because there's not enough space available to do its job and have the failover for two drives. So we got to add more drives. So if we add four drives, now you can see that with SHR2, you have four six terabyte um, drives and out of the total of 24 terabytes, you'll have 12 in green that is available for use and 12 is used for protection. With SHR1, you'd have 18 and six respectively. So uh, we have five drives so we're gonna go ahead and add one more. And this is what I'm starting, basically starting out with here. So I'll have 18 terabytes to start with for use, 12 terabytes are for failover. If I went with SHR, uh, just the, the SHR1, I'd have 24 terabytes available and six terabytes would be for failover. This still allows you to fail one drive, but if you're in the middle of rebuilding a failed drive, and something goes wrong, you lose the entire array. And I didn't wanna take that chance. I figured if I'm going through this amount of effort and this expense to get good protection, um, I'm gonna you know, spend the extra to kind of use one of these drives here, um, an additional drive to have that extra peace of mind. So um, let's say you, you can now also add larger drives. So if we wanted to then add a 10 terabyte drive in addition to this, um, it's basically saying now, okay, well, I increased my usable space on both of them, but now each of them has a little bit of unused space. So it's kind of not really an optimal configuration indicated by this little section here in gray. If I added another 10 terabyte drive, now the full there's full utility in the SHR1 configuration, but I still have eight terabytes that are kind of unused and are not used for protection in the SHR2. Um, basically, the reason for that is, is that you have to have double your largest drive capacity. So I've got to actually increase the drive space one more time. 
actually I have to increase it to, to two more times. There we go. Now, in either configuration, I'm at least using all the space. I have 20 terabytes for failover. That's double the size of your largest drive. And I have 50 terabytes of usable space, and I would have 60 terabytes in the SHR1 configuration. So that's kind of how this calculator works. And it shows you how you can you know, ultimately increase your drives. I mean, if you, I guess if you kept increasing these at 10, you could start to take out your six terabyte drives and start slowly migrating um, yourself into a higher level of storage capacity over time, all while the thing's running basically 24 seven, which is pretty darn cool. All right, so I just wanted to show you how this, um, this process and this little calculator worked. And um, let's get on with the install. So here we are at the front of the rack and uh, the Synology is all hooked up and ready to go. No more flashing yellow light. That's because we have the DSM software properly installed and uh, a volume has been set up uh, without those two things. That's why the light was flashing. And you can see, you know, the five lights of the five discs that were uh, installed to get us started. And uh, that's what it looks like from the front. Uh, so I'll take you to the back of the rack now and we'll take a look at what all of the connections look like back there. All right, so here we are at the back of the rack with everything installed, hooked up, and working. Um, so I have my uh, iMac is coming off of this blue line down here at the back of the patch panel. Um, I kind of just ran it over to a closer port here and came over this way. Um, that line just unfortunately doesn't reach, you know, directly over here, so I had to just kind of snake one over. Um, made a little cable for that. And uh, we have in the bottom SFP1 plus port, you can see both of these have, I'll just get a little lower here, you can see both of them have the white lights. That means that they are in fact seeing a 10 gig connection, which is very important. Um, so in from the iMac Pro here, out coming up to 10 gig port uh, on the Synology. We have that little green light there. Um, let's see, I had a, I have a, a second line coming out here. I don't actually know if I need this line, but I was thinking, well, if other computers in the house are trying to get to it, they're not gonna be coming over the 10 gig line here. They may just need to see it this way. Um, both ports have their own separate IPs, so I can literally configure each laptop, computer, et cetera, in the house to specifically talk to the Synology through a very specific dedicated IP. So um, you guys can let me know in the comments if you think I need two ports like this with two IPs um, configured separately or if just one would do. Um, probably it wouldn't matter if they were accessing it separately, but if they're accessing it at the same time, I just sort of thought, well, maybe it makes sense to have two connections. Um, if you listen, and I'll stop talking, the unit's pretty quiet, which I like. Um, I have to double check the specs to see what kind of electricity draw it makes, because this thing's gonna be running you know, 24 seven but uh, hopefully it's not gonna be too, too bad on the electricity bills. But that's it for the hardware. Um, let me see, just the uh, the transceiver modules, these are just a piece of cake to put in, just pull the rubber plugs, uh, just carefully um, insert them until they click, You know, just give it a little push with your thumb, make sure you have a good seated connection. It's always good to wear um, those protective gloves, which I did not do, um, but I'm gonna, I know I should say that you should because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and uh, yeah, that was just easy to install, no big deal there. Um, yeah, so that's it for the hardware here. Everything went in really easily. So let's get back to the computer and talk a little bit about the software side of things. Okay, so now we've installed all the hardware and we've made all the cable connections back at the switch. So the next step is gonna be setting up the software. So here we are uh, on the Synology website. This is actually at um, download.synology.com and it kind of takes you to this download center here where we can install the Synology Assistant from, uh, from their website. So for the product type, we're gonna just select NAS and here we're gonna put in the actual product, DS1819 Plus, there it is. And this brings us down to their dis DSM or Disk Station Manager software, uh, which is the operating system for uh, the Synology NAS. So if you just click the download tab here, it will give you the version that you need for Mac or Windows automatically. Now, once you launch the Synology Assistant, uh, it looks like this. And uh, it's not gonna have anything, it'll just be clear here at first, but you're gonna hit search. 
and it will go through and it will look for all the Synology products or interfaces that it can find on the network. Now, in my case, we have two interfaces. There's two connections coming from the switch. I have the one gig connection coming from port 23 over to the switch, and then I have the other connection um, coming from the SFP, uh, uh, SFP Plus port, um, the outgoing port um, from the switch over to the NAS. So there's two separate connections that I can specifically connect to from any computer in the network that's on the same subnet. Once we've established uh, one or more connections to the NAS uh, is you just click it and it'll take you over to either the setup, if this, is, if this is your very first time setting up the NAS, or it'll ask you for your login credentials to log into their operating system, which I'm gonna do right now. So the web interface here is what you know Synology calls their DSM. Uh, it's a nice little interface. It's very easy to navigate. In the upper left corner here, there's a sort of a main menu that pulls down into a bunch of different sort of separate little apps that you can get into uh, with a bunch of uh, them already sort of located here on this, uh, on this window. Um, one of the first things that uh, you'll want to do is go into the control panel and go into network and take a look at the network interface just to sort of see what your connections are all looking like. In my case here, you can see that we have an active LAN 1, which is the 1 gig port, and LAN 5, which is the 10 gig port. If I click it, you can see that this is running at 10, uh, 10 gigabit, and the 1 gig is at 1 gigabit. Um, so th those connections are working. They have the IP addresses. You can see the MAC addresses um, uh, as well. and. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like your network. Uh, I'm not going to take you through the whole um, bit of software here, but one of the first things that you're going to need to do, uh, and it will help guide you through this, is you have to set up a storage pool and a storage volume. So to do that, you're going to need to go over to the storage manager. So it gives you like a little overview here. It says that the whole system, you know, is healthy, which is great. Um, and if you go to storage pool, this is where you're going to set up your RAID configuration for the very first time. And it's basically the first step that you're gonna do. Now, it doesn't look quite like this um, when you know you get started. It kind of will walk you through the steps of what you need to configure. Um, it'll ask you to you know, make sure you wanna use all of your drives. Uh, and it kind of just walks you through that process. Now, the process of setting up your storage pool for the first time uh, I didn't realize this, but it takes a long time. Uh, it took about nine hours to fully configure and set up this uh, SHR2 um, storage pool. And that's probably not surprising uh, as I've been doing more research and understanding how SHR2 works. Uh, it kind of sets it up as a RAID 6 apparently internally, at least at first, which has a lot of inherent um, additional complexity that's associated with the RAID 6 uh, configuration to manage all of the different parity bits that go on to its um, its its uh, you know redundancy capability and that sort of thing. Um, but long story short, just be prepared that when you're setting up your storage pool for the very first time, that it will take a considerably long period of time. So it's not something that will be ready to use um, in just a few hours. It'll take it can take a, quite a while, uh, and also would imagine would also reflect based on the size of disks that you're using. And again. In my case, I'm using six terabyte drives. The last thing that you kind of need to do um, in order to actually use the storage is you have to set up a volume um, and give it a name to actually access it. Um, so I believe you can make you know, multiple volumes, but I think there's different uh, setups and cons uh, things that you might need to consider do uh, doing before you determine how many different volumes you want to make. In my case, I decided to just go with one volume for now, and eventually I'll set up different uh, different users and, and groups and all of those good things. But with those things in place, the way that you access the storage is you would go to um, in your uh, in your Mac uh, and on Mac anyway, you would go to um, your file, you know, go to server. Oops, sorry, not go to finder. You would do uh, finder, uh, go to server, and you would pick uh, you would use a AF the AFP protocol to pick your IP address of the incoming connection. So I can pick either the one gig connection or I can pick the 10 gig connection, uh, just like that. And if I hit connect, it basically goes ahead and it mounts a uh, the Synology just like that. Okay, so before we go any further, 
we have to talk. There's been a little bit of a plot twist here. I'm going to show you a speed test of both the one gig connection on LAN 1 and also the 10 gig connection on LAN 5 over on the Synology with this SHR2 connection and compare the Asia speeds of the local read and write that we performed before with the Synology. However, I have to confess, I already ran these tests and I gotta say, I wasn't super impressed with the 10 gig speeds. Let me show you what I mean. So as a quick refresher, when we ran the Asia tests before, as we're doing here right now, on the local hard drive, we see speeds in the realm of 23 gigabits per second for writes and 20, uh, sorry, 19 gigabits per second roughly for reads after you divide these figures by 125 to turn megabytes into gigabits. So I know full well that these speeds would be incredible to get over a remote network like this, but we're never gonna get there. If you take 10 gigabits per second and you multiply it by um, uh, 125, you're gonna get about 1250 megabytes per second. So uh, that is what we should be looking to see um, as a maximum throughput, and that might even be more theoretical than, than maximum. But uh, in any event, let's see uh, what we get in the realm of one gigabit per second. Here we go. Now we're talking to the Synology at, uh, through the one gigabyte port. So if we hit start using the same exact parameters as before, this is the kind of speed that we're seeing through the one gig port. So this takes a while, um, so I'll just kind of talk us through here, but we're basically looking at you know, read and write speeds of about 100 megabits per second for the read. Um, it's a, a little bit faster for the write. So it's you know, kind of approaching you know, 0.8 gigabits per second, which is, you know, is accurate, and it's certainly better than my Western disk digital drive, which when I connect that, it's almost too painful to, to watch here. Uh, that thing is getting you know, only a fraction uh, only 32 megabytes per second or about 0.32 um, gigabits per second for reads. So, you know, this is, you know, quite a bit faster than that, but this is certainly too slow to ever think about doing any kind of high-end video work across the network uh, on this one gigabit port. So that's the one gigabit port. Let's take a look at the 10 gigabit port. And now when I hit start, here's what we're seeing. So this is better. Um, we're seeing, you know, something in the realm of a sustained uh, read and write rate of about 450-ish. If you run this multiple times, it's kind of hovers around 450 megabit, megabit, megabytes per second for read and about 470 megabytes per second for write. Um, and if you divide that by 125, you get around anywhere from 3.6 to 3.8 gigabits for each of these respectively. Um, and even at the high end of these transfer for speeds, um, it's a little, you know, which is a little over 500 mega, megabytes per second, it's kind of still below four gigabit per second speeds. And so these initial results are leading me to a little bit of a plot twist here, leading me to take a pause before I go any further with transferring data over to the NAS to do any additional testing. If my ultimate goal is to get maximum speed and try to be able to hopefully edit 4K files directly on the NAS, and have good data protection since I'm gonna be working on paying jobs and can't afford long downtimes if a disk goes bad, then I realized I needed to look at possibly setting up a, a different RAID configuration and try at least a different strategy. So at the moment, I'm not able to afford all SSD drives, which clearly would be faster and would be a logical technology step to get better speeds. But I do think there's more room to improve the performance with what we have here, and at least I want to try. So I was up till three in the morning last night researching all the different RAID configurations, blogs, comparisons, opinions on SHR, SHR2, RAID 6, RAID 10. Oh my God, you can go down such a vortex trying to understand how all these various factors go into finding the best balance between performance and data security. And of course, in any of these scenarios, any RAID is not a solution for backup. You still need additional solutions to achieve a proper full backup of your data. But that said, SHR2 clearly isn't going to cut it for working efficiently, at least maximally as possible, I don't think. I mean, the speeds are probably considered good and they're well over one gig speeds, but they aren't anywhere near what they are working off of the local drive or even the theoretical maximum of 10 gig. And I know 24 gig speeds are not gonna be possible uh, with this configuration, but I'd like to get closer to what that theoretical maximum is. 
um, if possible. So after an evening's worth of research, I made the decision to try something new. I'm going to try to restripe this array and build it up as a RAID 10 configuration. Now, I'm not going to go into explaining all the different RAID types in this video. I'm really not qualified to do that. But a basic definition of RAID 10 is that it essentially consists of two mirrored RAID 0 configurations which is how you can achieve the best speed because RAID 0 is considered to be the fastest RAID setup at this time. And because you're basically mirroring that RAID, you're going to get excellent redundancy. The cons of doing a RAID 10 uh, setup are as follows. I'm going to be losing the flexibility that comes with the SHR2 configuration, which would allow me to add various drives of larger or smaller sizes down the road. Um, and as time went along, you can ultimately migrate your way to a larger RAID. Also, you have to stick with all the same drives in the RAID with RAID 10. And if at some point you want to upgrade to bigger drives, you're going to need to back up all that storage somewhere, replace the drives, and rebuild the RAID, and then copy the data back. Next, the cost of a RAID 10 setup is very significant. It requires you to double the amount of storage that you have because you're going to basically be working with two fully striped RAID 0 configurations to achieve redundancy. And if any one disk goes bad, it's just a matter of swapping out the disk and it will rebuild it from the mirrored side of the RAID. However, I did read that if a second disk were to go bad in the middle of a rebuild, there's a 66% chance that the RAID will rebuild okay and a 33% chance that you could lose the entire array. So that's something definitely to think about. The good news is that RAID 10 is considered to be one of the fastest RAIDs to rebuild versus a RAID 6, which is very much like SHR2 and can take much longer and is much more harsh on the spindles in the array during a rebuild. Now let's talk about some of the pros of this setup. RAID 10 should potentially be much faster, particularly with writes, if I understand what I read correctly. There is a bunch of formulas that go into governing what the cost of reads and writes are depending on things like the number of drives in the array, as well as the I.O. performance of the individual drives in the system and the latency associated with the configuration. But the short story is, because RAID 10 is based on RAID 0, it's one of the simplest RAIDs uh, to compute because it does not carry the overhead with maintaining all the parity bits that other RAID configurations like 5 and 6 carry, as well as SHR. At least for writes, the RAID 10 could be as much as three times faster in theory over RAID 6 because of the lack of overhead in the parity writing. Unfortunately, we're going to have to put a little bit of a bookmark in this test because I currently only have five six terabyte Seagate Ironwolf drives and you need an even number of drives to set up a RAID 10 configuration. So I've ordered a sixth drive and we're going to have to wait a couple of days to run this new test. But I did want to put this video out with what I've achieved so far with the setup and baseline testing and the comparison of speeds from the local SSD drive on my iMac Pro as well as some testing with the 10 gig configuration with an SHR2 setup on the Synology with the Asia disk testing tool. In a few days, we'll continue this testing with a total of six terabyte drives and I'll rebuild this and set this up as a RAID 10 to see if we can increase the IO speeds that we're seeing at all with that setup and then try testing the same tests that we did here in DaVinci Resolve that we performed in this video to see if we can work at 4K reasonably efficiently. So until then, I hope you found the information in this video helpful, and I can't wait to get that sixth drive uh, and compare these results to a RAID 10 configuration. I'm really eager to see uh, and hope would love to share with you guys uh, any differences between the SHR2 setup. I would love to see any comments below from you guys who I'm sure are a lot smarter than I am to see what you think of the SHR2 versus RAID 10 potential. And if you have any other suggestions on how we can wring a little more IO performance out of this setup so we can get to an effective solution to edit 4K video directly on the Synology NAS. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you're all having a great day out there wherever you are in the world. And we'll catch you in the next one. Peace and love, peace and love.